I also started the recording, so let's give it. Oh, so one person in the waiting room. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, maybe we get started. Peter, do you want to start? Or Ritu, one of you, do you want to start us off? Go ahead, Ritu. Absolutely. Welcome, everybody, for today's session. We have our brilliant speaker, Raghav, presenting on Rivet again today. And Peter is chairing the session. So, just like in the previous uh, days, we would be requesting you to post your questions on Slack and uh, we, will, we may be using polls feature here on Zoom, but for the questions, we request you to please post them on Slack and one of us will be paying attention to the Slack and bringing the speaker's attention to those. So I think we can get started at this point. Raghav, over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah, thanks we too. And also welcome everyone. So this is day two of our uh, Rivet tutorial. So we did one last week and I think it was uh, a lot of fun. And I think a lot of you very managed to run almost everything. Uh, get your Yoda files at the end, get your uh, root files as well, Com combining both root and rivet together to do an analysis. We talked about creating histograms within root, uh, uh, within rivet, and then also running a comparison with data. So that's actually where we are going to pick up today, right? So there are two things that we're going to, two big things we're going to go through. The first one is creating the actual, uh, plots from rivet you know the ones i showed you in the paper right so we're going to make those plots and then what we're going to do is run it on the heavy ion side using jetscape and then run a heavy ion analysis from you know like a pion dn data as a function of centrality bins or some ch charge particle dn data or some spectra for pi kp as a function of centrality bin, you know, things like that. So that's what we're going to do today and see how we can then run centrality calibration, how each experiment defines centrality, right? <clears throat> so all the tutorial for the we are primarily going to go through today is available on this link that I put in our July 20, <clears throat> July 26 Rivet uh, Slack channel, right? It's basically the same tutorial GitHub page from last week, except there's a new directory from Crystal that includes 
this new update for the heavy iron side. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. Then there's no slides today. It's only hands-on, right? We're going to jump straight in uh, from where we left off last week. Okay, so we are going to essentially assume that you know we have gone through all of last week and we have the container, we have the the river dockers, and we can essentially start playing with it. Okay, so let me start sharing. And as always, stop me anytime if you have any questions. So, all right. So, this is our directory that we created, right? This is on my computer right now. So, I made these uh, setup scripts. So, if I just do, if I just do this script, this cat Jetscape Docker, then you can see that it's, uh, wait, why is, give me one second. Okay, yes. So see, I run the Docker container uh, interactively. This is my directory on my computer. This is the directory inside the Docker image. Uh, and then the name that I give it, my Jetscape rivet, where I'm pulling it from. So this is, remember, slightly different than the original, like what you have been using throughout the week, the original Jetscape Docker, because this includes the writing to the FMC in the FIFO mode, but we will not cover that. This also includes the items you need for rivet, right? So just to recap, right? So if I, run if i just copy and paste this command this is also there in our uh if i go to the github where is my i had the browser up oh, here it is it went somewhere else right so if you want to run the rivet uh, uh the jetscape docker that's over here just to just to recap you can see here this tanner mango jetscape rivet right so what we are actually going to start with is get a actual rivet docker right so let's go to the first step in the tutorial page so step zero eight so i want to copy this guy and then i'm going to go to my terminal and then i'm going to paste it here so what does this command right we are essentially running uh oh see someone else yeah, I also keep letting people into the into the rooms now. Okay, so Docker run it. I'm going to change where the location is on my computer, right? So you can put it wherever you're right now. So if you do a pwd, that tells you where you are, and you can copy this command, and then you can do Docker run minus it, put the directory, and then the directory inside the docker container is that thing and then the rest we can just copy from the command right on the github page so i have already gotten this image yesterday which means it's it went already it already went into the image for me right so it's going to take a little bit of time for you to download this uh, and if you started downloading this, when you hit this command, put a little uh, thumbs up on the in the Zoom so that I know that it started running for you. Okay, don't worry about this warning with the platform like that's this is the whole part of uh the whole reason why we use docker such that we try and decouple from the system but there's still some slight differences that can affect performance but we don't really care about it right now also don't worry about this uh, where root is where we'll also fix that later we, we don't really it's not really relevant for us right now so you're all getting this rivet docker, yes? 
So once I'm inside this slash work, I can just do which rivet, and you can see that it's installed right here. So this is different. It's a different container, right? Basically, it's taking it from HEP store slash rivet with this version 3.1.8. We installed it separately in the Jetscape container. And that's what we will go to later, right? I just wanted to show you this because we can start by already making plots from the stuff we made last week. So if I do LS here, I have effectively mounted this directory onto the Docker container, right? So I have all these directories. So if I go into the rivet analysis that we made all the Yoda files last week, And you can see the stuff that I tested for the tutorial. I'll remove that later. But if I do check all the Yoda files, you can see we made all these plots uh, last time, right? We made the uh, output PP Yoda. We made the star comparison for the data, right? So this is the data Yoda file that we got when we pulled, when we created the analysis using the inspire link, right? So this is, you've done this, I'm reminding you guys. And then this is the analysis that we ran using this, my first rivet analysis. And then we learned, we made it into the star 2006 I709170.cc. And that created a spectra of pi plus, and we compared it to the star data, right? That's the histogram that we want to make. So I already made this one yesterday, so I'm going to kill this for now. Ah, just a small comment then, okay. Let me let me quit this. So for to just to back up so that we are all on the same page. I, uh, Archita, I see your I see your question. So now I'm in my home computer, right? I'm not on any Docker container, any virtual machine. This is the directory where I downloaded and installed everything from last week, right? When you start a container, you have to tell the container, the virtual machine which directory from your home machine you want to import to it, right? So that's exactly the reason for this command right here, this dash V, and then you can see this thing here. So if I do slash user RKE work, Jetscape, this Jetscape school, and then the colon, that is the directory on my computer that has all of this stuff, right? And then I port it, into the work directory inside the container. So when I run this and I do LS, I see exactly the same thing, right? Even though according to the container, I'm inside slash work. But according to my computer, I'm inside here. Does that make sense? Okay, good. So let's go into the rivet analysis directory. Uh, I'm also going to remove this heavy eye because we will then make it later. Should have done, should have done yesterday, but that's fine. So the first thing we need to do, because this is a new rivet container, we created, we built the analysis in the previous container, right? So we have to make a slight change. We have to remove the rivet star uh, library. And then we have to build it. The command for building it is like this. So you do rivet build and you attach this capital R I small I V E T and then the name of the analysis dot S O. So that's the library you're creating. And then the analysis dot uh, CC, right? So let's go, 
look at what we have inside this thing. What did we do in this piece of code? Right? Just as a reminder, we created the, the uh, class for this particular analysis. We defined the constructor. We declared the final state to be all, we only want to select pions within a particular eta range, and then the PT is greater than 300 MeV. Uh, we said only accept pi plus, right? Then we declared the final state using this particular string tag, right? So this is the final state projection that corresponds to these cuts that I have here. And then we defined the pi plus histogram to take the binning from the HEP data of that particular paper. So 211 corresponds to table number two in the, in, the, in the HEP data. And table number two corresponds to PP collisions. You remember table number one was, I think it was P gold or D gold or one of those things, right? And then we book a counter that just counts how many events we have selected. Like if we had an event where no pion was available, you don't want to scale by that number. You're not getting this, you know, you want to scale by the cross section that is accepted within your cuts for this particular example. You can also scale by the total cross section if you want. So then for the analysis, we go into the analyze function that runs event by event. We start with our identified pi on final state and we get all the particles that belong to this final state, right? We do the cuts that are in the experimental analysis, which is the absolute value of the rapidity of the particle to be less than 0 0.5. Uh, we define the PT of the particle using the rivet particle class. The function is dot PT, right? This is just a, a consistency check. You will not get pi minus in here. So there's no need for this line of code, but you can have it because we were doing charge particle and neutral particle comparison. So if you want to do pi plus and pi minus, you can also do this at the same time, right? And we filled it and then we weighted each entry by one over the PT, right? So the lower the PT, the larger the weight, and then you get the spectrum. And if we went through the event and we analyzed the event, we filled in our counter, right? And then we defined our uh, scatter, to be calculated, uh, the, the factor for the scaling to be calculated by one over two times pi and the sum of weights, right? And then we scale the histogram by this factor and then we did some C out statements and then we defined our counters and the histogram as private members of this class, okay? So that's a quick recap of the analysis. I'm just opening up my, oh, here we go. In case someone sends a message on Slack. So we have now built, we have built this analysis. And what we are going to do now is make the plots. We are going to use this Yoda file and create the plots from within rivet. And the way you do that is you do rivet dash make HTML. And I want to show the Monte Carlo statistical uncertainty, right? So that's this flag. And then I can do dash O uh, plots. That's the name of the output directory that is going to create the plots. So plots PP uh, 200 pi spectra comparison. Just I'm just naming it whatever I want. So when I look at it, I know what it means, right? And then I give the Yoda file. And then I can just put a little colon and then <clears throat> inside the single quotes and I can write what, what Monte Carlo it is. I can give it, like I can say, this is Jetscape PP. I hit enter, let's see. We only asked it to make one plot. So it's making that one plot. 
and then it already knows that it's going to compare <laughs> to the star data. Using the canonical name is recommended. I don't know what that is, but it may created a directory. Let's go into the directory and it has, uh, you see here, it has a directory and then it has an index.html. So what I'm going to do is open this index.html. Actually, but now I'm inside the container, so I have to go outside the container. Uh, so see plots open index, and this opens in my Firefox. That's my default uh, web browser, right? My, my code. So it, then it already tells you what the plots are, right? So it's saying plots from rivet analysis, identified hadron spectra in PP at 200 GeV using this star analysis. And then you can go to the Inspire link of that paper. You can go to the head data of that paper. It gives you a citation because we didn't touch any of this. It pulled all of it from, from Inspire. Yes, the last command to make the plot is this one here. Yeah, I'll make it bigger. Oops. All right, everyone make the, everyone have this plot folder. Give me a, give me a thumbs up. What, what happened to my, oh, here it is. Couldn't find my Zoom. So Raga, if you wait for multiple thumbs up before proceeding. Yeah, I usually check to see if people are, are more or less doing okay. And if there's the the thumbs up also doesn't stay, it goes away. The thumbs, so the thumbs expires. Maybe people should use a different uh <clears throat> different symbol. Yeah. Like a smiley face. That's also fine. So if anyone has a question or an issue with running this, then put it in the Slack. We have people on Zoom who are monitoring. We also have people on Slack who are monitoring. So they will definitely help you out here. So there was a question a couple of moments ago from Anjali, show last command. That was two minutes ago. So I don't know whether that was... Uh... Yeah, that's this one here that I just showed. Yeah. Anjali, did you get it? Yes, I got it. Thank you. Okay. And guys, let's go to the plots. It, it actually tells you here how you did it and what you created it with. So if I click this link here, ah, it made the plot, but then it didn't show the it didn't show the star data point, which is interesting. Is you this are, what you're trying to type, Joseph? You, you're missing the PWD option. I missed the PWD option. That's yeah, it's good all job. good. Yes, thank you for pointing it out. So let's add a, after this name of the output file, Let's do a dash. Is this dash dash PWD or dash PWD? Remind me. It's gonna be two dashes. Well, it's in the it's in here. And this is what happens when you try to run it from memory. Dash dash PWD. Okay. All 
All right, small, one small error. We have to rerun this. Uh... Oh, I'm inside the plot directory, that's why. So I'm going to kill my plot directory and then run the code again. But then this time include this dash dash PWD here. Dash dash PWD means we, we are telling Rivet that the comparison is actually here in this directory. It's not stored somewhere else. So use the, the star Yoda file that's in here to make the comparison with the data. And then it's running, it's running. Let's see. Ah, now see, it's actually good because it didn't give us any warning uh, like it did last time. So that's good. So now I open the thing again. And there we are, folks. We have our first plot from Jetscape uh, comparing to star data for the pi on spectrum. So you can see the y-axis here is the cross-section normalized, how it's done in data. Uh, and then the red curve is your Jetscape PP generation. Right, uh, and then you can see the Monte Carlo statistical error bars are quite bad. They get pretty worse as you go to higher and higher uh, PT. So the x-axis is the is the pion PT. It automatically creates a two-panel plot, and it does the ratio with the data in the bottom. And the data we didn't touch it, right? Automatically pulled from the HEP data. But this plot is not <clears throat> all that great, right? Because you need you need the axis labels and you need the, you know, <coughs> excuse me, telling exactly what's being plotted here, right? For that, we can go back into our code. And this is where we are going to do something that's kind of fun and not in the actual GitHub tutorial page. But Ron, actually, I have a question. So you go yeah. back to that. So the ratio in the bottom plot. Mm -hmm. well, it wants ratios, but the dynamic range is, is poorly chosen. That's, I guess, automated, but it doesn't seem to do the right job. Yeah, the dynamic range in the uh, in the ratio by default is from 0 0.5 to 1.5. So it doesn't actually check the range of the... No, it won't the check. The, you, but I'm going to show you how to change all no, that. I, I understand. I'm sure there's flexibility, but you would, yeah. you would hope there's a little intelligence in choosing that, but I guess not. Well, they're hoping that whatever Monte Carlo you're doing doesn't is not off by a factor of two compared to the data. That's a high yeah. energy physics expectation. Right, right, right. Yeah, we, we could be off too, but we can change it to two to zero. I mean, there's a way in which you can set it. And that's what I'm going to show. So Anjali says, how did I open that PDF? Uh, so if I go to the directory, that made the plots, right? This plots PP 200 spectra, <clears throat> that has an index.html, right? That's a, that's a browser page, right? So you just open it outside the Docker container. So this, this is outside the Docker container, this is inside. You can see here by this root at whatever string here. Then if you open it, you'll see the plot. All right, so <laughs> we completely skipped this last time, but this is our analysis, right? We went through the star analysis very, very recently, but there is also a file that Rivet makes for you that star 2006i, whatever, 709170.plot. That's where you can give some information. So if you go there, uh, it shows you begin plot star 2006 D01X01Y01, right? And it has some title, X label, Y label, and any additional settings. And this tells you to see the make plots documentation, right? So let's do that. Let's go to our browser and type make plots uh, rivet 
documentation. Right? So there's this first link that shows up when I just did this. If I go to that page, I can link this in the... Uh, can one of you guys, uh, Joseph, Crystal, one of you link it in the Slack channel so people can see. So make plots is the actual command that Rivet uses to create that plot that we saw. Right. And the way it does it in the background is actually quite interesting. So it takes your data file in your Monte Carlo histogram and your data histogram in text files, converts it into an intermediate LaTeX file, right? And then it runs LaTeX to PDF and then gives you the PDF that we just opened up and looked at, right? So here are all the options. And here is an example, right? It says begin plot figures. This is the analysis MCW jets. They want to plot the W mass. And we know that W mass is around 80. So you want the X min to be 60, X max to be 100. You can tell where you want the legend X position. So each plot has units of the X goes from zero to one, Y goes from zero to one. So if I want the legend X position at 0 0.65, it's a little bit more than half of the plot, right? And it tells you some information, what each plot begins and ends. It tells you how to add titles to this, right? And then it tells you the label, uh, how far away from you want the individual uh, axes labels to be. Do you want to have uh, tick marks? Add the axis, you know, how root you can create your G axis and everything. So you can make a whole lot of modifications with that. You can also create the two sided ticks. So I really like this because it makes my plots look professional. So let me go and start editing this. So, first, firstly, we are doing D02, right? That's the second table. The first table is D goal. We don't care about that. We do the second one. And then the title is let's say this is uh, PP 200 ion spectrum uh, pipe, I guess it's pipe plus. And you can do, because this is LaTeX, you can do everything like this. You can do, you can use LaTeX, uh, you know, kind of, kind of natively, right? And the X label is uh, PT. Then units, GV or C. And then the Y axis, you know, you can do one over two pi, one over sigma, however you define it, you know. And then the units is one over GV, C over GV. And then we can add a few other things, right? We wanted to add these two-sided tick marks. So let me add that. I'm going to say one, both the X side and the Y side. And then uh, Peter brought up the issue with the ratio plot, right? Here you can set the log scale for the Y and then the default <laughs> for the Y axis. You can saw that the plot actually turned out to be a log scale, so that's nice. Uh, we can ask it to show full range. We, we don't need to make it zero suppressed, for example, but we're doing a log scale, you, you don't wanna do that, right? So you can also scale it. You can rebin histograms at the plotting part of it. So this is all very useful when you're doing your own analyses. Uh, you can set the color of the margin. 
legends. I mean, play with all this. You have you have the link. You can go and then and then edit it. We'll only do the thing for uh, here we go. Ratio plot y min, ratio plot y max. Let's copy that and then we put it here. And y min, let's say zero, y max, let's say three. We save it and we don't need this one. So once we save this, ah, Peter, you have your you have your hand raised. Yeah, you, sometimes you have histograms that have incommensurate binning and you want to take their ratios. So how does that deal with incommensurate binning? So the binning is actually derived from the HEP data for this particular histogram. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the Jetscape and the and the star data may have, you know. Sorry. So the Jetscape data are what they are. The app data, uh, star data are what they are. They may not have the same binning, but you want to take no, 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 no. By by definition or by construction, if I go to my analysis directory, yeah, I have declared. I, I covered this, this yesterday, but yeah, but mm -hmm. I have declared this pi plus histogram to use the binning from the HEP data. So okay. by by definition, that histogram will have the data binning. The Jetscape histogram. Yes. Uh, and does it use the Berry Center or or just the center of the bin? <laughs> ah, good. It it uses the uh, algebraic center of the mean. If the <coughs> HEP data is put in where you have this uh, skewed uh, mean mean PT binning, then I think it will also take it, depending on how you plot it. All right. I don't want to belabor it, but sometimes you want to take the ratio of data to data an RAA, for instance, and there the binning comes as is and you have incommensurate binning. So, okay, that's a complication. That's still one, no, no, no. Even there, you won't have incommensurate binning. You still take whatever binning that is in your comparison for data, right? And we, we, we will go to the RAA when we do the, when we do the heavy iron part. That's, okay. again, again, easy. Okay. All right, so... We then made changes to our so our dot plot file, right? We included all these guys. <coughs> Excuse me. We can go back uh, to our container, and then we will say. I mean, I don't think we need to build the analysis again, so we will just we will just make the plots. As long as it has a dash dash PWD, it should still create it uh, correctly. I think. Let's see. This is a, this is the part where we uh, where we are testing it. Ah, to edit the text file outside the container, <laughs> I just have my I I just have my Emacs open that I went into star. 2006 dot plot and then and then and then edited this. All right, so it says it's done. And there you go. It automatically included everything we told it to. There's the title, there's the x-axis labels. Uh, I did some funny latex thing, but that's fine. But yeah, there you go. Now it went up to three in the y-axis labels. We can also reduce this one <coughs> all the way down. So that's how you do the first part of what we had planned for today is to make actual plots. Uh, we could not do this for the Mac with the Jetscape rivet container that we used to run rivet and run Jetscape in the last week tutorial because there's some very, very annoying Python uh, issue that I told you guys last week. We haven't figured it out yet, but I hope we'll figure it out in the future. But in the meanwhile, this is your workaround is you have your rivet Docker itself. You can make your plots in there. Uh, in principle, you could also run your analysis in here. You, you just can't run Jetscape because this rivet docker knows nothing about Jetscape, right? So this is basically the first part 
of the tutorial. So now, <laughs> if you have not been able to run this and make this plot, or if there are any issues uh, doing this, please post it in the Slack. Otherwise, we will move on to the next part of the tutorial, which is running the heavy ion side. All right, good. So then I will kill this and then let's go to our tutorial. So we already did this, we visualized the plots. So now we get into this uh, step for the analysis, okay? So now we have to go back to our Jetscape container. You see this uh, T Mangle slash Jetscape rivet latest. That's where we need to go to. So I already have, as I showed you, a, a script that takes me there. And that is, again, same setup as before. You want to know the directory you are currently in that has this Jetscape P4 rivet analysis, this direct, the, the mother directory of these guys. For me, it's this. And then the directory inside the Jetscape rivet container, <laughs> the name that you give it, uh, the, if you want to do, a, you know, with the hands-on, in some of the previous hands-on, you all did the uh, Jupyter notebook, so you have to give it a particular port, right? And then this is the name where you're drawing it from. You're drawing from Tana Mengel's uh, code, right? So, so let's let's just run it. So I'm gonna copy this one. I'm gonna paste this. All right, here. Now you have your I have no name. That's excellent. That means we are in the Jetscape one, but we just have to make sure that we are in the right directory. See here, last time I told you, make sure you're in the correct directory. This one took you to home Jetscape user. We just need to go to home Jetscape rivet user, and then you can see. Everything from my computer is now available here. Okay, this is where we installed Jetscape, guys. Okay? So inside this Jetscape FIFO. Right, we had everything done inside our build. <laughs> so we, we, because we're going to run heavy ions, it's going to take a little bit of time, right? Uh, what we are essentially doing is running the heavy iron side with some hydro. We are going to reuse this thing. So let's go into that. So once you go into the external packages for this example today, you're going to need uh, these three external packages. So we're going to rebuild. Jetscape, right? So I'll do this. I did this yesterday, but you can see you can just kind of copy each one of these and then paste it and then it'll download it. Even though I already have it, it's fine. Let's download it again. It'll take a little bit of time. Same for the music, same for ISS. And then <laughs> you're going to go back. You're going to create your build directory. First, you kill your old build directory. Uh, then you create a new build directory, go into it. You run the CMake with these options on. Uh, and then you run make. And then you will have your Jetscape executable ready, right? You can also use the Hydro examples. Right, so if you go inside here, there's a get hydro sample, lead lead 2.76 centrality <laughs> zero to five. So you do you run that script, that'll get you it. And then you can go into the Jetscape part and then let's run it there. So this is going to take a little bit of time, right? If you, especially if you haven't done this before, uh, so we have a little bit of a workaround, right? So you can follow this tutorial in here. 
And then you can see how to set the number of events and reuse the hydro for that many events because you don't want to have the same. You don't want to use multiple, multiple hydro. That just takes up so much memory. It's fine to reuse it, not really a problem. Uh, you have your Jetscape HEPMC writer. Uh, you have your initial state modules. What we ran yesterday, and you will have this HEPMC file that you can download that's actually much faster, is going to uh, the hard process in Pythia with a PD head min of five, a <laughs> max of a thousand. And you all should know what a PT hat is at this point. That's basically the sub process when you do the hard scattering. So if you have your diegetic production, it's the momentum transfer in your hard process that transfers part of that Q squared is essentially PT hat, right? Uh, that tells you what your scale of the jet production is. Uh, we have the center of mass energy. We set the PDFs, et cetera. We tell it where the hydro module is. And then you run it using this setup, right? For me yesterday, this took some time to run. For some other people, for Crystal, it apparently only took half an hour. I'm very jealous of the computer that she has, but really did not take half an hour. It took much longer. So we have a workaround. So <clears throat> from this Google Drive, we have the individual, <clears throat> like the HEPMC file after running. So we just going to download it and then run the rivet because this is indeed a rivet tutorial, right? So you have the information in here if you want to run your Jetscape, produce the files on your own. But for now, we will just use this HEPMC file and then we will go into the rivet analysis for the heavy ion side and then go into that in detail. Uh, I saw something pop up in the chat and then it went away. I think that was you, Anjali. Did you, did you have anything to ask? All right, let's see. This is ah, the port is already located. Tanner, could uh, or not Tanner, uh, Crystal or Joseph, could you guys check uh, this particular error from Anjali? I think probably. Yeah, it's probably a space issue. You or you just need to restart it. I I would think. All right, but that's fine because let's download this this HEPMC file. Uh, and I'm. Seems like pretty fast internet connection. So this is going relatively quickly. Okay, so now I have downloaded this. The whole reason why we run this <coughs> Jetscape part, right, is to use this Jetscape Docker, create the heavy ion, FMC file. And then we can go back, actually, we can go back to our rivet. Uh, Docker and then use that HEPMC file to do all our analysis, right? So that's kind of the easy part. So I'm just going to exit this Docker, go into my my rivet Docker, right? That's here. Go into rivet analyses, <laughs> and in the meanwhile, if I go to my downloads. You see, I have my lead lead FMC. Oh, turns out I already downloaded it before. So let me. Uh, okay, I have to fix that later. But here's the here's the file that I downloaded. Right, I'm going to move this one to the location where I have my rivet analyses. Right, so I'm going to move it in here.
There it is. Lead lead <laughs> 2760 dot Right. So now we have the hep MC from heavy iron from Jetscape, right? We are going to create our new heavy iron analysis. Yeah, that's fine, Anjali. I think we are going to go back to using our rivet, uh, the, the rivet docker that you already have installed. So just go back to your rivet docker and then download this HEPMC file and we are ready to go. Okay, so let's create our new analysis. Uh, rivet make analysis. And let's see, let's at least stick a little bit to the tutorial. What did we call it? Uh, that's fine. We'll just do it like this. Make. Let's do rivet make analysis, heavy iron analysis, right? That's going to create, that's going to create these three files, heavy iron analysis.cc, heavy iron analysis.plot, and then the dot info. So if we now go into our tutorial directory that we got last week, right? from Crystal. So we could just pull it again, such that we have now the latest version. If there's any changes, right? There's, it's going to tell me that this heavy iron tutorial, there's a new directory, there's a readme file. That's the readme that I showed you on the previous GitHub page. It also has the heavy iron analysis.cc for comparison, right? So what we're going to do is basically use this heavy iron analysis file, okay? So let's go take a look at this code. So I'm going to go into the tutorial directory and then go into the heavy iron tutorial and then heavy iron analysis.cc. All right, so <laughs> what does this analysis look like, right? So we start with everything usually the same. These three are always almost the same, right? They are getting the base rivet analysis class, getting a base projection for final state. If you want, you can also get jet projections from this. We briefly looked at it last time. You can get things that are specific for heavy ions now, right? This is, for example, the Alice collaboration has a significant uh, interaction with the rivet people such that they have created Alice specific heavy ion tools, right? I, this is what I wanted to go over with you guys today, right? So let's go over this. So I'm just going to copy this rivet tools at least common just show you what's in there it's taking me to the older versions the oxygen doesn't want to go very quickly Let's see. Uh, at least I have it here somewhere. Ah, yeah. At least common. Yeah. So basically, it's we, <laughs> we can just go to the first link. At least common dot h. All right. Let's zoom in. See what this is telling us. This is telling us there is they created a new namespace. They use some certain cuts, right? They define the V0A acceptance 
of the Alice V0A detector. So these are vertex, well, the, these are detectors that are a little bit far away. So the A is on one side, C is on the other side. And you can see here that the cuts are the vertex, I keep saying vertex, the V0A detector is in eta from 2.8 to 5.1. And it only takes charged particles. So, you know, absolute value of the charge greater than zero. And then the C <laughs> is from 3.7 to minus uh, one, minus 1 1.7 to 3.7, right? We also have the different C, uh, CL0, CL1. There is the eta acceptance of the detector and it only takes charged particles, right? And then there's some definitions. <laughs> so that's what's in uh, Ali's common. Let's go into projection because projections are how you get the particles, right? <laughs> From your event. So this is under rivet projections. You have the Alice common dot dot um, HH. So you essentially create a new class for V0 multiplicity. Uh, it is a single value per event, right? So you can then say use it for two different modes. If mode less than zero, mode means like, is it a condition, right? Are you using V0C or V0A? And then they say, use the acceptance. This is the cut, right? Take, if there's nothing else, then just take V0 acceptance or V0A acceptance or V0C acceptance, right? And then you declare a constant final state with those cuts. And those cuts are defined right here, right? So that's how this works. You could do exactly this for your favorite detector, right? I could go now inside here and then go to the rivet projections directory. I can create a CMS uh, projection for a particular centrality selection. So CMS, the centrality is done using the forward hadronic calorimeters. Say so here's my, my hadron calorimeter in this particular eta range. We don't really care about this side or that side in, in lead lead collisions. When we do proton lead, yes, you want to see which side is relevant there, but you can declare a particular final state that only corresponds to those guys. And you can sum up those particles energy, and then you have it. And you can see here, this particular one, the project for that particular uh, centrality in at least is the multiplicity, right? because it applies the final state projection, gets the particles, which is a vector, and asks for its size. Just the number of particles that go into those cuts, right? That's how you get the multiplicity for at least, in this case, centrality using these, these detectors, right? And then there's another example with the CL detector, so that multiplicity. You can also run trigger selection in here. Right, you have a V0 trigger. Uh, make sure that you have particles in this particular range. You can do coincidence between left and right. Uh, they, they also declare what a primary particle is. And this is the thing that is almost always uh, really straightforward for experimentalists and confusing for theorists from time to time, right? What we call a primary particle is something that we can actually measure in the tracker, right? Uh, you can see here, there are some particles that according to their PDG, like Alice considers those to be primary particle. They are declared in this case, uh, everything else is, it returns true, is primary PID, everything else is then false, right? So these are all relevant for Alice. Uh, you could do exactly the same thing, as I said, for your detector, CMS or Atlas or you know, Star, S Phoenix. We could do exactly the same thing. So let's go back to our code. That's the projections at least common, right? So we go into the default constructor. We declare our final state. We declare our centrality using the V0M multiplicity, right? Uh, this includes both. So we have our Alice 
2015 lead lead centrality. That's the that's the tag that we are using. And we define sets of histograms, right? So here we have the charged histogram. Now, obviously, at least doesn't really measure the full neutral histogram because the, the EMCAL only sits in one part. And then now, I mean, they have it bigger, but not, not really going to measure neutral particles, right? We can only use the charge. So this is just an analysis that you can play with. We're not going to compare with any real uh, measurement in this case. If you want, I've already showed you how to do that, right? And we define this histogram for centrality zero to 30%. Uh, one set of histograms for zero to 30, one set of histograms for 30 to 60, and another set of histograms for 60 to 90. So uh, Karen, this file is in the tutorial. If you go to the uh, tutorial that I have linked, and you will see inside the heavy iron tutorial directory, there's a heavy iron analysis.cc. That's where this is. Yeah. I asked Rivet to create it. I'm just going over the example that we had from the, that we worked on that you guys can then take it and play with it. So I also booked counters that tell you how many events went into this particular case. So you can then start counting. And if, you, if you're generating events with different, different cross-section weights, this counters will take those sum of weights into account auto, automatically, right? So that's all we are defining for now. Let's just use this. And then later on, we can add another histogram that does RCP, right? That compares the central over peripheral. You could also do RPA, but then you would have to run this over PP with the same centrality, and we just decided to not do that. Yeah, we'll get to the copying. I'm just going over the code first. We're going to copy this from the heavy iron folder to our rivet analysis folder, actually. All right, so now we go to our uh, event by event analysis we get our final state particles uh, that apply the projection using this tag FS that we defined up here. Can we do all of this in the root? Yeah, we, we are going to only use this one root container today. That was, it's the rivet container, the one that says root at something inside slash work. So that's the only container we're going to use today, Anjali. Yeah. So, right, we're going to get our final state particles. We get our centrality projection, right? That uses this V0M centrality that we talked about and it gets a number, right? And this is the centrality number and then we can get See, this centrality percentage is basically use the cent of, and then if this is greater than 90, 90% 90 centrality, you veto the event because our ability to trigger on very peripheral events goes down really fast. Uh, <laughs> the multiplicity becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. And we can just do our very, very simple conditions. There are much smarter ways to do this. You can put it all in a loop, right? That loops over the centrality boundaries that you have defined. Uh, but for now, we just decided to copy and paste it so that it's easy for you all to see. So if centrality is between zero and 30%, we fill in the counter for that particular, uh, for that particular centrality. We can then loop over the particles and say, if the particle is charged, fill my, my charged particle histogram. If it is neutral, fill my neutral histogram. Uh, and then essentially the same thing for 30 to 60% centrality, uh, 60 to 90% centrality. 
Now, in principle, you really don't want to loop over all the particles three times. You really want to loop over uh, the events that are you know, relevant. So if you have a certain centrality, you can just loop over the particles and fill it in, right? So you can do this in a much uh, smarter way, but again, that's for you to optimize. That's all we're doing. This is it. This, this analysis will fill in histograms for each of these centrality bits. Right? Now, in the finalized function, we can go ahead and scale our histograms. So I can scale my charge 0 to 30% with the number of events I have found in my 0 to 30%. And then the same 30 to 60, and then 60 to 90. And that's it. And then I've declared my histogram pointer uh, array that maps each string to its own histogram. All right. So that's our heavy ion analysis. So what I'm going to do now is so now I'm inside my rivet container, right? So I'm going to go to my rivet analysis where I created this heavy ion analysis dot cc and i'm going to copy my heavy ion analysis from there to here so this one then shows you the new analysis that we have got from our github page we have copied it and we have pasted it here which is good so now we can build it and the way we build it is like this. Okay, we have our rivet heavy ion analysis. So now let's run it. So I'm going to run the heavy ion analysis that we just created using the PWD option, which means use it right there. Ignore the beams because rivet will check a certain particular type of beams, and then it doesn't like it when other generators use different types of beams. So we're just going to ignore it. And then we're going to use our HEPMC that we just made and download it, right? You can tell other people you made it, it's fine. And then you can say, uh, let me write it to, uh, so this is running at the LHC, uh, lead lead 2760. Uh, spectra charged centrality bins, uh, I guess, dot Yoda. Let's run it. Let's see if it works. Aha, it wants a centrality calibration file. You see, we have to tell it what the centrality calibration is. And this one, I think we already got this calibration file in our, uh, oh, yeah, here we go. This calibration file Crystal has made for us is in our heavy ion tutorial directory. Right, so we have it right here. So we have to just copy and paste this file uh, into here. You can say dash p. Uh, well, I have to copy and paste this first. Cp, heavy ion uh, to.
and it tells you how to do it, right? You can preload the calibration file using the dash P flag. So we can say dash P and then this is the calibration file. Let's see if that works. Ah, Karen, good point. Thanks for identifying the funny typo. Did one of you guys already fix it? It's the path if they were to run Jetscape. So since we're not running Jetscape and just pulling the HEPMC file, they can just put the HEPMC file instead. Yeah, did you put the, maybe I'm doing this wrong on the fly. Did you have the centrality calibration uh, path in here? Okay. Dash P, yeah, it's right here. All right, let's 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 copy this and then paste it. Oh, wait. Ah, I forgot the centrality equals gen. I forgot that tag that we have to give. See, this is where I should just follow the tutorial and not go off base. Okay, so back to the thing, guys. Let's copy this. You see the step five? We run rivet, we build the analysis. So I'm going to copy this file and paste it and run it. Oh, I forgot to change the directory again. Going to complain. Okay, once again, from the top, rivet uh, dash dash pwd, use everything in my current directory, dash p for the centrality calibration file that already shows you what the distribution looks like. And then from there, it can pull out 30% decile bins. And then dash a for the analysis that we want to do. And then the centrality <laughs> tag that we give it is just gen because we just want to use the generator centrality. You could take the data centrality and also use it in that case. Uh, ignore the beams, write it to our this particular output file. Let me change the name uh, to something that I made before. I'm going to copy this. And then this is our input FMC file. All right, third time. Let's see if this works. Yay. It's running. Okay, 800 events, say maybe 30 seconds, it'll finish. All right, histograms are all <laughs> written to our output Yoda file. All right, so I want to take a pause here before we look at these plots. Has everyone gotten to this point? <laughs> I'll put this command up here so you can copy it if you want. Are you able to run this heavy ion uh, analysis with this centrality definition? Uh, let's do a poll, shall we? Shall we? Uh, where is my... I'm going to launch this poll. So fill in your answers, folks. You're all caught up, should be done in a minute. If anyone's stuck,
So for folks who are stuck, I see two people. <coughs> this is the goal of the workshop, guys, essentially today. You let us know where you're stuck and we figure it out, right? Everything else on top of this, I've given you the basics. You can go run wherever you want. So. Well, I'll just briefly, it's been going over an hour. What's the, what's the break plan? Uh, yeah, it's 9.17. I was going to suggest like 9.20 or 10.20, maybe like a 15 minute break so I can go get another coffee. Sure. And maybe the people who are getting caught up in a minute should be able to catch up by that time. Do you want to break now or in a few minutes? We, we, we can already go, go into break now. And then I'll be here for maybe a couple of minutes to help. And then there's also other people on Slack and Zoom who can then help the folks who are getting caught up. So reconvene at, uh, at 25 to the hour? Yeah, 9.30 uh, or 10.35, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, folks who are, again, the, there's, two, there's two people who have told us that they are stuck. Uh, let's do it, let's, let's help you up. Let us know where you are stuck and then we can get you all caught up. Although I am happy that no one has said nothing is working, which, which is a good thing. All right, next case, I will go make myself a fresh uh, coffee and then I'll be back.
Okay, bye. Hi, hi. So just a quick, I'm looking at the messages. So uh, Anjali, if you want to build Jetscape, you have to be in the Jetscape Docker, the one that you could not load because of the port issue, right? So this root at whatever number Docker is the rivet Docker, right? I'm gonna end the poll there. So, <coughs> so for the rivet Docker, rivet's already installed. We don't compile Jetscape in that. We only use the Jetscape Docker to create the HEP, the, the HEP MC. And then we use the rivet Docker to analyze it. <clears throat> okay, good. <clears throat> Let's see, where are we? We have a couple of minutes. Good. Yeah, we will also add, I forgot to mention this, there is a step that we kind of skipped uh, at this point <laughs> is one could potentially uh, create your own centrality calibration file. Uh, we skipped it because it's you need a lot of events to create the distribution and then you can take the bins from there. <laughs> so this one, the centrality calibration, uh, you can essentially uh, produce it uh, by running an analysis that just plots that that observable for the centrality, right? And that gives you a Yoda file, and then you can find the deciles within that Yoda file. So I will link <laughs> at the end of this to another tutorial uh, where Rivet Heavy Iron creating this particular one goes into more detail. So that we won't do today. I think we'll only do a, a couple more, and then we can probably end a little bit early uh given that you guys are already doing a lot of stuff here so we'll i'll link another tutorial on how this is done Okay, uh, shall we get started? Everyone back. Ritu, Peter, you guys ready? Yes, ready. Thank you. Okay, good. So we just created these Yoda file from running over the whole events. We can now take a look. And we are inside the rivet uh, Docker. So we can create our make HTML. Uh, the Yoda. And then we have to give it the input Yoda file. So this MC error, as I already told you, is to use the Monte Carlo statistical error bars. PWD is this analysis is found in this directory. You don't have to search anywhere else, right? And then make sure that the name of the output is something that you understand, that if you come back to it a while later, you know exactly what is being made, right? And then we run it.
no bin value errors and just what that is interesting. Let's look at our code in a while. 60030, so that's that looks interesting. So let's 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 take a look. We made the plots, yeah. So it made it into a oh, it made a directory. I didn't need this dot URL file. That's fine. So I'm going to go outside the container. And I'm going to cd into this guy. And I have the index.html. And open it. Uh, so all this information that you see here, the brief description of what is measured and what is used for, LaTeX, Inspire, Hep data, all this information is available in our. Uh, let's go to our rivet analysis. Okay, so this is the this is the analysis.cc, right? If you go to the heavy analysis.info, this is where you provide this information. You can say this, you know, we can do this is 2023. Test analysis of heavy ion particle spectra during the Jetscape summer school. And no experiment is, well, we can just say we used Alice centrality. And then we can say Jetscape. Uh, Inspire ID, this is not a publication, so we don't. <laughs> oh, my. Sorry. Sorry about all the coughing. Take another cough drop. So the status, we don't usually touch this. This is for the rivet expert, for them to tell us whether their analysis, whether our analysis is validated, uh, their have data or whatever it is. You can give your information. So if you share your analysis with someone else, they will know how to contact you. You know, you can do all of this stuff and then you save it. And then if you compile the analysis and make plots again, they will show up right here. So it looks like <laughs> in the thousand events that we ran, we only ran a very small number of events, right? We actually did not find anything in our zero to thirty percent centrality bin because we sort of minimum bias collision, right? We found a lot of particles. We found a lot of spectra in our sixty to ninety percent centrality. You can see here is our uh, charged particle distribution. Uh, this is our neutral PT from sixty to ninety. So you have the spectra there. Uh, this is the neutral and then the charge spectra for 30 to 60. And you can already see the statistics is getting worse. Uh, and for the counters, it actually tells you how many of each type of events you found. So it says you that you found, uh, we ran a thousand events, right? So we had almost 900 events where we found it between 60 and 90% uh, <laughs> centrality. Now, uh, yeah, uh, like 800 something. And then we had, this is 10. So we had, you know, so nine, eight, seven, six events in the 30 to 60% centrality and no events in the zero to 30% centrality. So you all know the centrality is like this falling distribution, right? So we have to generate more events in order to fill this from a minimum bias sample. Like, I mean, you could also change the centrality that you run if you only want central events. We didn't sort of do that uh, in this case. So we did use the calibration that we had. So that's telling us that we only found these, these types of events. 
Okay, so that's basically uh, what we had in our analysis. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> what you can do is also ignore, if you're only interested in how, running your simulation and seeing how your jets are quenched, right? You don't really care about centrality from a experimental point of view, but you only care about centrality <clears throat> from your Monte Carlo point of view, right? If you generate central events, you only want those. You can just ignore the centrality calibration and just directly go into your central events and do your analysis. If you want to look at jet spectra, or if you want to look at identified particle spectra with a certain PID, you can go ahead and convert these final state particles into pseudo jets. And then that gives you an, a different vector of pseudo jets that you can then use to run your jet finder, like what we sort of did last week. So this is like overall uh, what we had generally planned. So if I go to the tutorial, <laughs> This is then telling you how you can actually visualize your heavy ion analysis. Uh, so we still have some time for, we have a lot of time for questions and we can also do something more. If you guys would like to see a particular jet analysis in heavy ions like the jet mass or some substructure, uh, I can try to code it uh, using what we currently have. Uh, and then we can also try and see ratios ah, that we should do, but we don't have any central events. So it's not, not all that effect, effective to make a comparison, uh, but I can show you quickly how to make ratios. So that is available. Uh, I showed you this last time the code that we used for the star tune in Pythia, in Pythia, uh, in Pythia 8, we had the Detroit tune, right? Uh, so we had this, uh, this code actually shows you how to make a ratio histogram. So this took a ratio of pi plus over we can try and do the ratio with the semi-central. So actually, let's 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 do that. So this is an example of how to book a ratio for pi minus over pi plus, right? Using some binning. So we'll just copy and write that for our analysis. And let's do. <laughs> and it's a scatter plot. When they take a ratio, they call it a scatter plot. So we're going to do. Uh, central, peripheral, uh, charged ET. And the binning is we will give the binning that's right here that we used. Okay. And let's see where, where else this guy shows up in this code. The only thing you have to do is after you normalize the histograms, we divide and we just change uh, let's do semi-central and then this is uh, we want to do the peripheral ratio and then we change the name to this thing. All right, and we also have to define now our scatter 2D histograms. Oh, it should be here. Change the name. All right. That's all we need to do to create ratio of central to 
in this case, mid central or mid peripheral to peripheral. So then let's run our, we have to build our analysis before we run it. And we could also do ratios of charge or neutral if you want, right? Uh, let's run this. I see Yasuke is typing. Yasuke is going to ask me to do jet shapes. Is that right, Yasuke? Uh, sure not, but I, I want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> no, tell me what you are going to. What, what, uh, so, right. So, uh, you, so. Uh, we are supposed to use exactly the same uh, rivet code to do uh, to, to do the analysis both for uh, PP and level, right? Because yes. division yes. should be done in the in that script. Yes, so that is a little bit more complex because you have to write your analysis specifically for. Uh... So I, I have done this for analysis that are not using the data definition of centrality is very simple, right? You can just say, do you have the centrality output from the generator in the HEP MC? So like the, the HEP MC can have a centrality tag. So if you just mm -hmm. take that, that's your generator level centrality. You're not doing any calibration in that case. Then you can just say, if centrality is, is not, is like less than zero, then it's PP. Right, because PP will not will have a ill-defined value. Uh, I see. I see. Right. I see. So we can we can put the the negative value for the, the yeah. centrality tag or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Got mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that makes your same code run for both PP and lead lead. <laughs> yeah, when I do the, yeah when I do the dual comparisons from the same analysis for HEP MC from dual PP and dual quench, that's exactly what we do. But that's using FMC2, it's also not using FMC3, which is more useful because that have you can put more information in there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So I've I've built the analysis. I have run it over the HEPMC file. Now let's make our plots. Come on, make the scatter plot. That's what I'm waiting for. Maybe it had some non-zero values and then it's going to complain. Let's see what happens. I keep I keep making it again. So okay, here we go. Ah, wait, here it is. There's our scatter normalized to the number of events. So there's no additional TAA scaling or whatever in here. So you would have to <laughs> throw that in by hand, uh, including it in the cross section and stuff. So if you do that, then you will get a proper RCP. So if you normalize by the number of triggers, which is sort of what we have done, uh, number of events, not really triggers, then it's just a sort of an IAA, but not truly, but you know, there's your, there's your ratio. Yeah, okay, good. So for the, <laughs> if you go into the same, uh, where's my,
Yeah, anyway, so if you go into the tutorial, we had this link for the star analysis page, right? So rivet analysis, there should be, I should have put this link in here. Okay, I'll, I'll add it if I did add it. Uh, ah, it's over here, okay. So this particular example has the one I showed you uh, last time. It uses the jet mass measurement for soft drop as well. So I'm just going to go over this one. And can you guys put this in the in the Slack chat as well? So again, in fact, let's just copy it and then I'll show you how to how to run it. So rivet. Make uh, make analysis, jet mass uh, AA. Yeah. All right. I just copied the entire code from that GitHub page and I pasted it here. We're just going to go ahead and like change a lot of things. So the first thing we're going to do, we use the star 2021 jet mass inspire. So it will automatically get the binning from the data, right? We don't want to do that right now. Let's just make a comparison to, uh, let's just do our Monte Carlo. And right? we don't have to do any comparison right now because we don't have the correct centrality. Any of that is fine. So what I'm going to do is copy this and then replace this with jet mass AA. So you can see everywhere it had the star 2021, blah, blah, blah. It just changed it to jet mass AA. That's it, right? So that tells you that you're now using a new analysis that you just created. Uh, and you can see we have included a lot of fast jet headers to run our own jet finder. We have included the contrib that gives us the soft drop information for the substructure observables, right? So because this is star kinematics, we have done absolute value eta less than one. We can compare uh, substructure for different uh, splitting functions, so for different parameters, so Z cut of 0 0.1, beta of zero, that is the default one. We can change this. Uh, We can compare two different types of grooming as what is done in the CMS one. Uh, we can do strong grooming and we can call it beta of two, Z cut of 0 0.5. And I'm going to book histograms and we're using these tables because we compare to data. Right, let's just make our own histograms. Let's make things simple. Book underscore H, I'm going to call it jet mass R04 default grooming. And I'm only going to look at one PT bit because we don't have a lot of statistics. Right, I would assume we would get something like five to 10 GV jets, even though you have to do background subtraction and everything. We'll get into that later. Clearly we are going off-road here. That's fun, so let's go. So the mass, let's do maybe 20 bins from zero to 10. I don't think it's gonna be much larger right now, but let's see what it looks like, All right? Let's do this for now. And then I'm going to kill all of this. I don't need this. And then we can compare to mass uh, strong grooming criterion and uh, call this PT. And I, guys, I don't expect you to completely follow this. Just, just, just look, follow this on your own laptop, right? So just take a look and see what's going on. This is recorded. I will also put this analysis on the GitHub page. 
uh, you can then go ahead and try it out later when you have time. So we get the final state particles. This is exactly the same as before, right? Apply projection, final state for an event. We get the final state particles, and then we define our fast jet selectors. We only need R equals 0.4. Let's kill all of these things. So we are defining the selector eta for R equals 0.4 to be between plus minus 0 0.6. So that our whole acceptance is plus minus one, right? So the jet axis plus the jet radius should be contained within my full acceptance. Right, so 0 0.6 plus 0.4 is 0 0.1. And I can define a minimum PT for my jets, uh, let's say five, because I'm looking at five to 10 GeV. And I can define a selector that does both of them where I just combine both of those, the PT and the eta together, right? And I can define my jet definition using the anti-KT algorithm, the radius of 0 0.4 and I can define my soft drop criterion here. I'm going to kill this because I only want one radius. I'm going to define SD default is beta default, Z cut default, symmetry measure, and then this radius can be whatever large. I mean, it doesn't really matter, it can be one because you're using soft drop inside the jet, right? And then for this one, I'm going to do strong grooming, beta strong, Z cut strong, symmetry measure, one zero. And that's just saying use the scalar Z in order to take it. And this is default soft drop stuff. So there, that's all the fast jet stuff we will need unless we go to the, uh, unless we go to the cluster sequence, right? Okay, so now we have our pseudo jets we need for the particles, right? I already told you guys that, that rivet has its own vectors of pseudo jets. So a pseudo jet is a single object that corresponds to a, of type, you know, pseudo jet that's defined in fast jet. Pseudo jets, in this case, is basically so these two are exactly the same, right? I'm defining a vector of pseudo jets, and that's identical. Okay, I mean, yeah, there you go. So these are exactly the same. So Rivet does this in the back end. So you don't have to type std vector, facet, any other stuff, okay? So let's just kill this line. And then we go into loop over all the particles that we found in our final state, right? We, we push back a pseudo jet that's made up of the PXPY PZE, right? And there we go. So let's kill R equals 0.2. We need R equals 0.4. We define our cluster sequence using these particles uh, as, fun as the type pseudojets. We use our R equals 0.4 definition, and we want to get inclusive jets with a PT cut of 5 GeV. If we found any jets, we can loop over the jets. And then we can say, let's just kill this. All right, so we looped over our jets and then say, if the jet PT is greater than five and if it is less than 10, let's then say our pseudo jet soft drop, right? Soft drop default jet is SD underscore def of jet. And now here I can say, if,
if the soft drop condition passed, right? That means it didn't, it didn't break that I have a soft drop jet, then I can fill my histogram. Let me go to this guy and say, fill uh, SD Jeff jet dot M. And now I can essentially do the same thing, but now I can do strong grooming. Right, so there I'm com I've compared two different types of grooming for my observable uh, and that's it. We can also do something interesting that compares the uh, 2D correlation between them. For that, it's useful to use the, the root histogram. So we'll do that later if, if you still want it. So, okay, there you go. That's basically the uh, jet mass distributions for this default grooming and the strong grooming. And then, well, we just wanna normalize the histograms, right? Because this is a per jet quantity. So we just go here, uh, we take the name that we have for the histogram, we paste it. And then we do it once more for the strong grooming. And then we have to make sure that everything we changed is declared. And that should be it to do jet substructure. Essentially, only you know, a few small lines of code. I mean, this is still not correct because we are running heavy ion collisions. These jets don't have any background subtraction to them. Ideally, you should run a constituent subtraction if you're looking at substructure. If you're only looking at the momentum of the jet, then you can run an area-based subtraction. If you want standard observables, then you can then do whatever it definition of the background is defined in your experiment. Uh, but for now, let's do this. I mean, you could do, maybe, maybe I'll do constituent subtraction later. Let's see what this looks like. All right, so we're here. This is, uh, I forgot to save this piece of code. All right, excellent. So now rivet build uh, rivet and then jet mass dot so. There you go. Because this already includes fast jet contrib, fast jet tools. Uh, so you don't have to additionally load any libraries. It's already there in the back end. Yes. All right, it's there. So now we want to run it. Rivet minus A, uh, jet mass dot CC. And then, oh. Ibo, what's, what's happening to your computer? Okay, my computer decided to take a little nap. That's fine. We'll copy and paste this guy. And then we do dash dash PWD. Uh, and then we need we want to run over this HEPMC file. And then the output Yoda file, we want to write lead lead 2760 jet mass. Uh, Grooming comparison dot Yoda.
running something out of the box. Let's see if it actually works <laughs> or if it throws me an error. It should be good because then we can debug on the fly. Oh, what, what did I do? Uh, couldn't find jet mask AA. I just, all right. Um, okay, interesting. Maybe the PWD needs to be over here. See if this works. I forgot about Slack over here. In case anyone has any questions. Okay, interesting. I was able to build it. Uh, Yeah, I'm not, <laughs> this is kind of fun. Not really sure I'm understanding why, uh, why it's not running. But we should be able to run this. Let me just see if. Init method, we couldn't find her. Wait, did I? I defined the histogram incorrectly. Yes, I found it. Okay, sorry. There's a, we defined the binning ourselves, right? So this means that it still decided to look for a have data and then take the binning from there. So we have to define it in a slightly different way. We have to follow this setup. That's why. All right. So we have to tell it the histogram title. Okay, so now it knows that we are user defining our own histograms and we are not relying on any HEP data. Now let's try. Come on, come on, come on, work. Yes. It's running. And it's using fast chat. 
So it came all the way to the jet and it's running over the, the, the different number of events. And let's see, it's taking some time because it's running jet finding, right? So it's taking, well, actually this is faster than when we run the centrality calibration. So it's interesting. Yes, okay. So now we have our grooming Yoda file. So let's make the plots. <laughs> Let me just show you what all options you have here in the rivet make HTML. You can add multiple Yoda files to the same one if you want multiple lines on top of each other, right? Uh, you can give it the number of threads that you want to do. So multi-threading is already put in. Uh, you can say make the offline you know, HTML, don't use any website, just make the plots, right? You can also ask it to make some fun little booklets. You can change the font, right? You can use Helvetica, Times, whatever font they have. Uh, and there's, you know, some, some options that you can play with. Plots, lead lead, jet mass, grooming comparison. And then we have, this is our Yoda file. And then we do Jetscape, let, let. All right, this is done. And it created our plotting directory. So we can go into that directory outside the Docker container. I'm going to open index.html. Here I am. Hey, there we go. This is the jet mass histogram. No background subtraction. No running lead lead <laughs> with a very low PT hat selection with the jet PT of roughly five to 10 GeV. Uh, so these are definitely like background-ish jets that you find. So this is the jet mass for our uh, default grooming criterion. This is our jet mass for the strong grooming criterion. Uh, you can then you know, go deeper and then compare what these two different ones look like. But yeah, this is an example of how to do jets uh, in heavy ions. And I told you, let's let's finish with doing the, I'll show you how to implement uh, background subtraction here, right? So usually the way I do these things is I've done this at some point, right? And pretty much for all of us, like the code exists somewhere, right? So I just find out where I did it or how someone else did it. And then you copy that and then you see if it works for you. So what we are going to, because we're doing jet mass, right? I think we should do, <coughs> keyboard, come on. We have to go to the constituent subtractor class, uh, and then this is a, let's see, FJ contrib. It tells you how to do the constituent subtractor right here. Cool. Example eventwide.cc, perfect. This is exactly what we need. All right, it's showing us how to define all the different objects. You have the constituent subtractor object right here, right? You set the distance between objects. 
right? So what constituent subtractor does is it takes your high energy particle in your event, and then it kind of distributes the energy from the high to the low, and then the low basically comes even further down, and if it goes below zero, it kills it, right? So it kind of reduces your event based on the energy flow in your in your in your event, and you can it associates ghosts to particle like these very dummy low energy particle. It throws a lot of them. They are called ghosts, <laughs> and then it identifies what they look like. So what we're going to do is basically copy this and then go to our code. And then all of this one is a general analysis, right? Like it doesn't change event by event. So you want it to be, you want it to, to be in global scope, right? So anything you want in global needs to be declared in your, well, it has to be declared in the class and then it has to be uh, defined in your init function. So then your analysis function will have that in scope when it runs, right? So what we really need is to define everything in here except the subtractor needs to be a member of the class. All right. And then you can say, we also have to include what is it called? Pass check contrib constituent subtractor dot h h. Go. All right. So we defined our subtractor below. We defined our uh, delta r. Use that distance to go into this in detail. How it does it. We need to define the maximum eta. In in our case, it's this. But we also need to define the background row estimator. And this one is using this grid median background estimator. And I guess this can also exist in the as a part of the class. So we can use it throughout. Right, and max eta, we can just say 1.0. All right, so that's how you define it. And now let's go into how they actually use it. So where is the, let's find out how they do. Ah, here we go. Subtractor dot subtract event full events. We need these two lines of code. All right. So this is where we found all our particles. So particles in the event as pseudo jets are this parts. So now we do do the background subtraction. So instead of full events, I do parts, and then I do vector pseudo jets. I don't need to do that. I can just do pseudo jets corrected event subtractor dot subtract event parts. And now we can do some simple check. We can do. Total number of particles before subtraction equals we can do parts dot size 
And then we can just say after, and it's this guy dot size, right? And now we can define a new subtracted jets, and we can do CS sub, and instead of parts, you do corrected events. And then jets underscore sub can be CS sub. That's it. That's all you need to do to get background subtracted jets. So these are still vacuum jets, right? <clears throat> so basically what we can do is this is the, for the vacuum jets, you can copy it and paste it. And then in here, you can just say jets underscore sub. Everything else is the same. You can run exactly the same soft drop. And then you just have subtracted jets that we fill in the histograms. Uh, then we can create new histograms. And let's also, because we're doing background subtraction, we should ideally see uh, uncorrected jet PP and and then let's see what happens to the jet PT as we do the correction. We have raw jet PT and subtracted jet PT. And then let's go here and fill in the raw jet PT histogram. Jet.pt. And then inside here, these are my subtracted jets. Underscore sub. Subtracted jet PT that's filled. And then I have my regular jets and then my sub jets. Sub jet sounds like sub jets. Let's make it subtracted. Okay, I think I also need to include the this one. Otherwise, it will complain. And then put your comments so you know what you're doing. All right. So now we do our a different grooming criterion for both the raw and the subtracted jets. We have our mass histograms properly defined. Uh, we defined our subtractor using the constituent subtractor example. These parameters you can play with. I don't think there is all that uh, relevant to go into detail right now. We go through the event, we get our final state particles, we run our fast jet selectors uh, over them, we define our different soft drop grooming criterions, get our final state particles as pseudo jets, uh, set the particles to our background estimator, right? And then we can define our 
correct an event <laughs> based on the constituent subtractor that does it based on these particles, right? So now we get our corrected event. It's going to see out the number of particles that we have, number of particles after subtraction. So that's going to show you what happened to the whole event. And we created our background subtractor jets, basically copying and pasting, making sure that everywhere we do the regular one, we changed it to the subtracted ones. Uh, we loop over the vacuum. The only change here is we fill the jet spectra. And then we loop over our subtracted jets. And again, the only difference there is we fill our subtracted histograms, and then we have to uh, normalize our subtracted ones. Make sure the name is correct. And then we add this to this guy. And then we can normalize our jet raw jet et i think we normalized to the cross section no didn't last time when we did the spectra we normalized it to the cross section in pico barnes so let's do that let's just see what it looks like and then this is uh subtractor That what I called it? Yes. Subtracted PT. All right. That was a very fast implementation of subtraction code. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Excellent. It doesn't like it. There's some errors. Contrib does not name. Oh. All right. Okay. That's fine. And then for oh, the other errors. Subtractor not declared in scope. Mm, that should be fine. Let's 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 try that now. It's going to be more errors. Let's see. There's more errors. Uh, Button to apply the rip. What? Expected comma or full numerical constant. All right, that is my cat who will show up. He's actually right there now. He, he will show up later. He's yelling because no one's paying attention to him. All right, let's do <clears throat> let's do everything in scope. Let's, let's just define everything per event. It's probably easier that way. It's not the best coding style, but it's fine. It will work for now. So it doesn't like it when I do it here. Okay. And what did the example code do for BGE. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's just defined as a number. So I don't know what the problem is. So let's see. Five. And then let's see what else are we missing? BGE underscore GE. All right. Putting everything in scope seems to work. All right. There should be a way that you should not do this. This is not good coding practice, but, but today it's fine. You, there should be able to way in which you can put it inside the init function such that it calls. Everything in init is global scope, right? But let, we'll, we'll fix that later. Oh, we should, uh, I forgot to change the name of the output you order from. So let's write it with, Subtraction. All right, see. So we get the same number of particles. It looks like, so let's kill this. What we really wanted to see was the energy being distributed, right? Re redistributed. So we should plot the total, uh, the total row. We should ask for the total row. So instead of the total number of particles, let's say the total background row. So that's something we compare and experiment, right? What is the background density in the event? And I think this is just I was thinking. Let's let's see what the exact value of uh, the row is. Uh, I want to know what function this thing has. Bro, yeah, that's right. So this is the median background density per unit area. We can also get the fluctuations, which is the width of that. So, and then see sigma. Let's just see what this looks like. All right, come on. You can do this. Mission. Okay. Uh, a lot of times you saw that we were getting more peripheral events. So that's why <laughs> the row is essentially very, very small. So you saw we had 60 to 90, and then there were some, we killed events that were 90 to 100. So this median row estimator is giving us very, very, very small values because we don't have a lot of central events in our generation, right? It would be, if you had a lot more central events, then you would see lots of, objects being, being a lot of energy being subtracted. So now if you make HTML and then we create a new comparison with sub 
and then write this subtraction Ah, come on, let's go, make the plot. Ah, hasn't, it's not done making the index file yet, but let's give it a second, it will make it. But I know it was a very fast whirlwind through implementing subtraction, implementing substructure for your jets. Uh, I will, as I said, I will copy this analysis and paste it in the uh, in the tutorial page. In fact, I can do that right now while this is while this is happening. Yeah, so now we go inside here. Let's add a file. My jet mass analysis dot cc. All right, so it's there, guys. You can go play with these things, look around, see what different values you get, and this is still going. Oh, God. I think my Docker, because of all the different Dockers running, it's, it's taking a long time. But yeah, I think we are basically done. I don't want to add any more stuff. We've already done. We've already gone off base a lot, so that's it's fine. Are there any questions, any comments uh, uh, about what we just did? Any thoughts? Put it in your Slack. You're also welcome to unmute yourself and then ask here. <coughs> Raghav, there is a note from Yasuki in the chat window wait, wait. before yeah yeah I, I see that now i just looked at it before we go to yasuke i i let's i want to answer i want to answer archita's question so cluster sequence that that is the actual step that does the jet clustering right so this these two lines essentially create jets right this cluster sequence takes in the list of particles that did given jet definition, and then cluster sequence dot inclusive jets gives you the jets, okay? In the in a list of uh, pseudo jet vectors. Ah, so Yasuke is asking. So wait, wait, okay, then then let's let's continue. So if you use the fast jet projection as we did in the last example, last in the last week, we use the rivet projection of fast jet, that does it in the back end. It's exactly doing these these two lines, these three lines, right? It's defining a jet definition using the anti-KT algorithm right here. So it takes this line and 
creates a cluster sequence in the back end and then gives you the inclusive jets from that cluster sequence. This is jet finding, right? Whenever you say what is taken care of by the fast jet algorithm, this is the taking care of it, right? This is how you find jets. Does that make sense, Archita? Or uh, unmute yourself and let's have a yeah. We can we can discuss. Okay. So Yasuke's first question. So soft drop. I defined uh, this R in here to be one. So this is the R zero, right? So it can be the jet cone, but it can also be a larger number because you're just grouping all the different values, right? It's only relevant if you're interested in looking at the ratio of the angles between the RG and the jet radius. Like you can, when you calculate RG, it takes all the particles within that cone and groups them together. Because we're giving it a jet, sometimes the jet is not completely circle, right? You can have something that goes slightly outside of 0 0.4. So it's a little bit technical. That's why you want to have a larger radius in that case. So you can then calculate this theta, which is the ratio of RG divided by jet R. You can do it by hand once you get the RG. Right. So this, I usually set it to one, but you can also set it to the jet radius and it's not really a problem. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Actually, so, yeah. I, <laughs> sorry, this is completely relevant to the topic here. But so, right. uh, but anyway, so yeah, when I saw the uh, passage uh, program and then the, you know, so, so when you have a beta index uh, in the uh, in the soft drop, so, uh, up, uh, the delta r divided by r to the beta mm -hmm. is the is the number you can find the formula in the software right and then mm -hmm. then that the the r in the denominator should uh, is should be the same number as this r zero right no is it is it not true ah you're right that should be see this is where i got used to only doing uh so beta is equal to if beta is equal to zero, and then there's no problem. But right, <laughs> this is you're right, you're right. I got used to doing beta is zero, and now you're right. This should be. Uh, that's right. Let's just fix this. Okay. Oh, sorry, this is a very tricky problem. This was no, no, no. That's right. That's right. Good point. I thought this was something that. Wait, why is it not? Okay, there we go. Now, now we fixed it. And your second question for the hydro profile, uh, that might be the case as well. Why our final HEP MC is actually very small. So if you put in the final particles, then you will get a big uh, row. That might be it though. Yeah, but maybe yeah, we can try the same code for the output with completely set, uh, completely part, completely particle set in the event. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you if you give me that parameter, then I can run it, and then we can check this mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thanks for catching this. Good point. All right. Any other? Questions or comments? Thoughts? Did you all learn about Rivet? You all know how to run Rivet now, how to write your own Rivet analysis. Uh, you know how to write heavy ion analysis. You know how to write jet analysis. You also know how to do background subtraction. So if you run Pythia 8 with Angantir, for example, you can do exactly the same thing. You can compare Jetscape, quench jets with the background to Pythia 8 Angantir that only has the background, no quenching. Well, no real quenching. They have something else going on, but that's that's a different topic. You can then compare these two using the same rivet analysis, right? So yeah, I think you guys should be all set to go ahead and play with uh, rivet as you want. Do you have any questions before we end it this is still going 
That's that's my I think my Docker is just stuck. Let me stop sharing. And we can end a little bit early today if there's no further questions. That was a great presentation, Raghav. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So there's no other questions, guys. So as I told you, everything is on the Docker. Uh, it's on the GitHub page uh, that you need to run. Uh, I mean, we are part of this, right? So you can feel free to use the Slack to message me, message our crew. If you have any questions, you can also directly email us. And I think with that, we close today's session and we can come back tomorrow for more exciting stuff on on uh, on hadronization. We have Reiner here. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that, Reiner. Thank you. And I'll stop the recording.